Hola, buenas tardes, buenas noches, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. My name is Abelardo de la Peña Jr. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications with La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, welcoming you to a Friday edition of En Casa con la Plaza. En Casa con la Plaza is our virtual programming, direct from our home to yours. Uh, here um, on Zoom, we're broadcasting on Zoom, we're streaming on Facebook Live. And you're, if you're on Zoom, please use the chat feature there. Let us know who you are, if you're out there, that, uh, uh, let yourself known. Also on Facebook, please use the chat feature, the comment feature to uh, let us know you're out there as well. You could ask questions, make comments, use the Q&A. We'll probably take your questions after the conversation with our host and our guest. But for now, let me tell you a little bit about what's going on at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. First of all, En Casa con la Plaza is sponsored by Union Pacific Foundation and the Institute of Museum and Library Services at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. We are been open since the last year sometime, open every day except Tuesdays from noon to five for the time being. Pretty soon we're gonna be changing our hours. But for now, please join us this weekend. We'll be open from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. La Tienda gift shop is also open. All of our exhibitions are up, including our permanent exhibition, Sky Principal, and LA Starts Here. And our temporary exhibitions are up and going too. Uh, Patriotism in Conflict, Fighting for Country, Comunidad, and also LA Memo, Chicana, Chicano Art from 1972 to 1989. Uh, La Cocina, our museum and teaching kitchen dedicated to Mexican cuisine is also open. Change the hours there. We're now open from Wednesday through Sunday, 12 to 5 p.m. Not this Sunday, though. We have a special event going on. Uh, the inaugural exhibition is called Maíz, Past, Present, and Future, a tribute to Mexico's, I mean, the world's finest cuisine, Mexico, Mexican food. Chris Franco is here with us tonight. Hello, Chris. Uh, let's see, a couple things that are going on at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. Actually, one is off-site, taking place tomorrow. It's a fundraiser. Uh, our first big fundraiser of the year, it's Ana in the Tropics by Nilo Cruz, Pulitzer Prize winning play at the A Noise Within Theater. It's, uh, it's, it's going to be a good one. Uh, lunch reception at 12 o'clock there on the lawn at A Noise Within, followed by the play itself. So I'm going to drop in the, the URL so you could click on it, make a contribution, have a good time at the theater tomorrow. All right, here goes. Secondly, we have what next week at this time, we're not going to be doing an en casa because we have on tap at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, homenaje a Vicente Fernandez, el rey de las rancheras. It'll be featuring two of the best mariachi here in LA. El mariachi, el rey, no, el mariachi Los Angeles de Pepe Martinez Jr. y mariachi Las Colobri. You can't miss it. Doors open at 6.30. Uh, two, three hours a worth of music, all dedicated to Chente, and best of all, it's free. Uh, our host for the evening will be uh, Armita Meir, host of Telemundo's 52 Acceso Total. All right, that's all the commercials we have, but now we bring on the host of today's happy hour. Come on and join us, Dan Guerrero. Hello. Hello there, Dan, how are you? Chris Franco, I refuse to go on. Chris Franco, I love that man. I knew him when he was a boy. We go way back. So I'm glad Chris is here tonight. How are you? Hotter than hell here. What's that about? It's a little warm, you know. A uh, little warm. I was in Palm Springs this week. It was cool compared to today in LA. Uh, but it's going to cool down, I think, this weekend, right on time for, for doing outdoor stuff. You know, I got a new computer and it's all weird and I didn't have time to fix it up. So I don't know what the hell to do, but we don't care because all eyes will be on our guest tonight yes, as right. soon as I figure out who the hell it is. <laughs> ah, yes. I'm excited about tonight's guest. I really, really am. He's well, anyway, you should go away and okay. then I'll tell people about our, our guest. Right. Tonight. Good. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see it. We'll is see there anything else you life. wanted to say? No, that's it. Just uh, enjoy the weekend. Enjoy this show. I've been looking forward to it myself. All right. Yeah, me too. All right. <laughs> well, my guest tonight is uh, an acclaimed, and you can underline that three or four times, a playwright, poet, director, curator, educator, social activist, an artist who believes that the joy of making work is not just making the art, it's making community. 
His honors are many. That you can underline 37 times, including a uh, MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, better known as the Genius Award. Now, he is that, but we're not going to talk about it because, you know, he's much too modest and I don't want to put him on the spot. So, callarito, not a word. We're not going to talk about it. So, zooming in from Chicago, zoom in, please. Genius Luis Alfaro. Ah, there you are. <laughs> Hello, my friend. Is this in Spanish? Should I do it on Spanish? No, it's in English. Um, do you want to do it in Spanish? No, no. I've been I've been practicing a lot of Spanish because of my job. But, um, <laughs> but whenever I'm going to do something in Spanish, I do have to, uh, uh, you know, because you do use your tongue, your mouth, you use it differently. And you got to... Oh, like, yeah, yeah, it's very romantic. You know, I, every time I go into a meeting, I go, Buenas tardes, buenas noches, gente. Yes. You know, like you just become a whole other romantic person. So, yeah, I, I, good. I love all the floral things. But, Ay, si, mi rey. Ay, cariño, por eso está aquí. Uh, Eugenia Leon calls me, Ay, corazón de melón. I love that one. <laughs> I, I guess it's a compliment. I don't really know. but uh, it, it totally is a compliment. I always I always use my little, you know, words to kind of get by. So I always say, por supuesto. Oh, Pero, right? So I'm like, I'm trying to think of the next word, but I sound very romantic. Well, I'm doing it. When when Chris and I were working on the Paul Rod El Show de Paul Rodriguez back in the early '90s, and uh, we were all uh, pochos, you know, it was uh, Chris and uh, a Cuban American and me, and you know, we'd be there and we'd be setting up the the, the sketches, what we're gonna do, and uh, and what's that word in Spanish? Uh, 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 Ocho alert, ocho alert. We could, and then we'd run and find like a genuine Mexican to tell us what that word was. But we still stayed on the air for three years. So there you go. You're zooming, you're zooming in from Chicago. What are you doing in Chicago? Well, I've been here almost for a month now, and I'm going to be here for another two weeks or so. I'm doing an amazing project. A few years ago, my, my colleague, and I, I think you know him, so I'm a Chuy Reyes, Jesus Reyes, I and him. I were having an amazing conversation about um, mental health in the Latino community. Why do our people not seek out mental health the way we should, right? And so we were talking about it and having a big conversation, and I ended up doing a series of solo performance uh, workshops uh, with East L.A. Rep. And so this thing has just sort of stayed in my head for years, and I got an opportunity to apply through UIC, the University of Illinois in Chicago, for a program, and it's called Speak Your Mind, and I'm doing the opposite of talking to patients. Now I'm talking to doctors, nurses, medical students, caseworkers, and community health activists. So I'm going out into... You know, Pilsen, which is kind of the equivalent of East L.A. here in, in Chicago, an area called Gage Park, which you kind of would think of a, like South L.A. I'm going to all these little small clinics, plus the hospital. I'm going to um, the, the Pilsen food pantry, free food pantry to talk to, you know, doctors who work in healthcare, and um, talking to the people who heal us about what's healing them and and the results so far, I've done over 20 something workshops in less than a month, is that we've, we've realized that our doctors are, are as anxious and as depressed and as medicated as we are. And so one of the challenges here is how do we serve our communities when the people who heal our communities have gone through a, a really hard time during the pandemic? Especially Isn't that amazing? It is amazing, but let me ask you this, because I know I know you consider yourself a collaborative artist, that you, that, that you don't just write by yourself, and you do lots of uh, uh, collaboration, not, not only with other people, but your research is not opening books, but in talking to people, which is what you're doing here. So is all this going to become a performance piece at some point? What's going to happen with all this information and these workshops? Well, I've really kind of uh, offered them as storytelling workshops. So it's really people telling their story. I'm actually traveling with an interesting little cohort. So I have Dr. Young Kim, who's this amazing Korean uh, uh, Greek classics, Mediterranean classics scholar. I'm working with a woman named Christine Dunford, who's one of the co-founders of a theater here called Looking Glass. And she's also head of the theater department at UIC. And then a young scholar, Dr. Xiomara Cornejo from Compton, who is here uh, finishing up her PhD. So none of us are medical experts. We're all artists trying to figure out how to tell the story of mental health in our community. 
right? So it, will it be a play? Will it be a series of articles? Will it be testimonials? So, you know, I'm trying the first oh, part Poetry, could be a poem, you could do it. Yeah. So next week I'm doing the first kind of step of like sort of like um, what they say, you know, reporting out. And I'm having an evening. It's called Los Dos de Luises. And it's Luis Alberto Urea, the novelist and yes, myself. Yes. So we're going to be on stage and we're going to talk about this notion, this idea of all of us. I don't know about you, Dan, but I always felt like I had that crazy uncle in the attic. I had that tia from Mexico who was, you know, a little depressed, you know. And so we're... Everybody seems to have somebody in their family this way. And, you know, as the stories roll out, you realize how serious the issues are. But it's just been very beautiful. It's just been extraordinary, you know, very emotional. But it sounds some of those issues you're describing are on both sides of the fence. Yeah, absolutely. Patients. Oh, my goodness. My, you, for <laughs> Chris Franco, I can't even read the little things because he's going to make me laugh. But um, I, I will say that, yes, the, I will say that doctors are extraordinary storytellers. And, you know, when you hear very, very, mo there was a, a wonderful nurse that I met in the emergency room who told me, you know, this pandemic showed her that holding people's hands was something they did not do. They were not told to do. And she holds every patient's hand now. And then there was a caseworker who broke down in tears and said, you know, my job now is a different kind of listening. I'm a different kind of active listener. Empathy, right? Compassion. Yeah. All the things that you're not taught in, in the business because it's about money and getting the patients in and out. Now it's about the very human cost of what, what people are going through in this country. So I'm just so happy, you know, like, you know, look at me. I'm this Chicano from Pico Union and I'm in Chicago at, at this gigantic hotel, which is supposedly the most haunted uh, building in Chicago, which I love. And, you know, I'm just here t learning how to tell stories all over again. Because as you know, you know, you and I have had such an interesting journey in our lives. We're constantly in the act of changing and shifting. Sure. And, you know, so uh, theater is a, an amazing, amazing, amazing art form that changes itself. Right. So this is a form of theater. Absolutely. I mean, there are, and, and you, I'm going to jump everywhere here just because we can, we can do that if we want to. <laughs> but, but you have dedicated yourself to, to continue to write for theater. Uh, as opposed to doing television, doing film, whatever, I'm sure you could. So this seems to me it was a choice. And, and I know you had your only brush in the entertainment that world was with at Warner Brothers. Well, I actually wrote a movie all the way through that got produced that paid for my for my parents' house. Which I one? Wrote <laughs> No, I wrote a, a ridiculous film for tweens called From Prada to Nada. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I did that film. I can't believe 24 drafts and it went through 12 producers. And, uh, and, but I learned how to you know, do screenwriting, which was amazing, right? So that was really fun because uh, uh, you know, a lot of what I do secretly sometimes is I doctor scripts and I, I pitch a lot of stuff that I make money on. And so, you know, I, I think there's always an opportunity in our industry to flex the muscle, you know? But don't you, don't you find for the most part, I know some people go back and forth, you know, they do theater, yeah. they do, and, and that's the best, I think, because they can make, uh, you know, enough money to do that little indie film with that role they want to do or, or produce. Um, but, but it, it, for the most part, it's a whole different world. You get into films and it's a corporate world. You don't feel yeah. that in theater, not no. that it isn't a business, but it's a different animal, it seems to me. Yeah, no, theater is, you know, I started in poetry about 20-something years ago, and then I went into performance art, and that's really where I started to, you know, I'd, I'd always grown up in L.A., told the L.A. story, and then when I got into performance art, I started going into, like, Latin America and Canada, and then, you know, I started going to Europe, and my whole head just, like, boom, right? And and I think what happened is when, when I have a mentor, a woman named Marie Irene Fornes, the of great course. Cuban playwright, so Irene, you know, really changed my life because that's where I I found what I call the alchemy of my writing. All of the pieces of the puzzle came together. So I'm really committed to theater. I'm, I think that to make writing theater, being a playwright is also making audience. So, you know, that's why I work, you know, doing theater, producing theater, and finding the audience for theater, and also taking that next generation on their journey. Yes. You know, so that's all part of theater making right making plays is wonderful and i love doing it i'm still doing it a lot and also 
but also producing theater is a way of making politics. It's a way of a growing community. It's a way of moving our field forward, but also moving our, our gente forward too, right? So creating the opportunities for young artists to do their work is of utmost importance right now for me. I I totally I t I totally agree with all those things and and let's let's talk a little bit about those uh, uh, those years when you were very much uh, in the L A poetry community and you were doing your 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 uh, performance artist I saw you on roller skates at one that's, point that's right. right. And so, um, and you you still perform, of course, and uh, but you're not on roller skates, but um, but we have and we have a photo of you just as a young man. I think probably from around that time. Look at that kid. Oh my God, I've never that seen kid. that photo. So, what do you think of when you go when you think of those LA poetry days and that community? Was that a different animal from the theater community? Because uh, that preceded you're really going to theater, yes. Right. I think, you know, for me, honestly, if I could be really transparent, I would say that those were the best times because poetry, it doesn't involve any money. So, you know, it was like the way I survived in poetry is every time I did a, a poetry reading like at, you know, like uh, Barnes and Noble, I would say, could you give me a book or could you give me a sandwich? Right. Or so that really what I was doing was collecting all my literature through doing these poetry readings. But there was no competition. And it's where I met, like, you know, the, the great poet and, and one of my dearest, dearest friends, Maricela Norte, right? And I toured with her for years. And, you know, Naomi Quinones and Ana Castillo and Santa Cisneros and I are friends because of that period. You know, so I really met, uh, I really met a kind of generation of writers who were great mentors too, right? Who really took care of you. And, you know, I went on the road a lot. I was slept on everybody's floor. I'm like, you know, that was part of the thing and there was no money involved, but it was a great time of learning. So I, I love that period because it was, it was none of the competition. It was really about the celebration of language. It was really about how do you get better at this thing you do? I had, you know, I had grown up in a very violent, very poor neighborhood. My parents, you know, were, my, were farm workers. So, so my mother is from Delano, California, right? So part of the United Farm Workers and my dad was from Michoacan. So, you know, I think there was just a world that I had not discovered. And language was the way that I started to discover bigger worlds. You know, one of the reasons why I think I'm so enamored of you, Daniel, is that, you know, we, we have this shared Broadway history, this shared love of theater in New York. You know, when I was like in the late 70s, early 80s, I, I was in high school going to New York, right? So for me, it was like, how do you discover all these art forms, right? And how do you see the world in a way that I never thought I was gonna leave Pico Union. I just never thought it. It was not something that you dreamed of because I worked in a factory when I was 15 and I just thought I was going to work in this factory in Vernon for the rest of my life. And so all of that shift, the shift and change of the world opening up to you, but through other Chicanos, that's the thing that's so amazing. My first teacher, acting teacher was Rose Portillo. At the oh, inner city, oh. at the inner city cultural center, oh, my wow. first mentor was Tomas Benitez. Can you oh, believe it? God, yes, that's why there's <laughs> such a family uh, community here. That you know that most of us, some of us, unfortunately, we have lost, and but but you know we're still here in the trenches, beating the bushes, and and all that. But but I want to play something here. Um, first, let me read something here. Oh, my mind is going to so many places because you're just you're, you're setting me on fire. You got me on fire. Um, I want to read an article, not the whole article, a little an excerpt from the uh, L.A. Times, 1991. Oh my God. No, don't be scared. You come off very well in it, or else I wouldn't be reading it. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, and this was during a period when, uh, you know, I think you were doing your first major mainstay venue appearance uh, at LETC. That's right. Um, it, it, with uh, True Lies at LETC. Anyway, this is what he had to say. Gayness, Latino culture, family, Los Angeles. That's what performance artist and writer Alfaro is about, with no apologies. His solos, peopled with the denizens of downtown L.A., are among the most humanistic and lyrical stage pieces to emerge from the local talent pool in the last few years. Oh, that's, that's so pretty cool. 
Well, you know, I got my equity card on that show. And you know what was so beautiful about that show? Talk about mentorship. I shared the dressing room with three guys. And you know who those guys were? Culture I'm afraid. Guys. I'm afraid. Oh, my God. Oh. I shared. They were upstairs doing Bowl of Beans. And I was downstairs oh, doing True Lies. And Lord. in the middle theater was Reza Abdo, who was the great Iranian avant-garde yes. director, right, in his company. So it was a great time because I, I was just learning. But I would be in the dressing room with the guys, and they would be rewriting their skits for that night. Of course. <laughs> they're rewriting in the wings, those boys. Yeah. And, you know, it was something very <laughs> joyful and free about um, – Meeting those guys at that period, right? At that, when they were also really taking off and, you know, their TV show and everything, right? Yeah, so there was something very, very powerful about, I think one of the things that I, I'm always trying to do in our, in our industry right now, in our theater industry, is to make sure that there's a thread connecting us all. That you can see generationally between you and I and the next generation and the next generation. Yeah. That you can see that there's a path. To follow, you know, so the guys sort of showed it to me, you know, Jose Rivera showed it to me, uh, you know, of course, Luis Valdez, you know, all. I mean, I could just name all the names of people I followed for years and, and the people that I assisted and because, you know, I was really trying to, to connect the dots, the, the really the dots of how to have a life as an artist, how to live as an artist, how to be an artist citizen. Right. And that was really, really important that time because it was always great to be in those rooms, you know, to be a fly on the wall, to see people make their work. I know Chris Frankel's on today and, you know, it's so, it's so amazing because I was thinking of uh, Lands, Lands Anonymous. Right. And going wow. to see those shows at LATC sure. and you'd watch them in the in you know, when they used to serve the food in the lobby at LATC and they were all sort of huddled up talking about their show and you try to hear what they were talking about. <laughs> but in a way, that's really what it was. Right. We were creating a sense of community. So um, very important time, a very, very important time. And a, and a time of lesson, right? Good lessons and challenging lessons. In the middle of that show, when I was getting my equity card, I broke my ankle. Hey. And, I, and, I was, and I was roller skating. And the director, David Schweitzer, was a wonderful director from New York. We got a Lakers doctor to bandage me up, and I had to keep roller skating. And, oh my he, and, I, and he said something really amazing to me. He said, I, have fell, I fell off between shows. I fell off the sidewalk. How stupid was I? And he, <laughs> said, um, he said, you know, that wasn't an accident. You made that happen. He goes, you made that happen. Because oh. you're, you're self-sabotaging yourself because you don't think you're good enough. And you don't think you're good enough because you think that you grew up in this neighborhood and you, people in this neighborhood don't get what they deserve, right? And everything you were saying was right on, right? I was going to mess this up, this opportunity. And it was a great lesson. And that night, I took some Advil. And I got up on stage, the broken ankle. And, and I kept and I finished that show with the broken ankle. And you can do it. You can do it, right? If plenty, you believe of, it. plenty of people say there are no accidents, that there just are no accidents. There are all of this is divine, right? All of this all of this. I think about this a lot because I think, you know, uh, about you know, I write these Greek classics, right? Oh, and Oedipus okay. is so much about like, you know, did I do this or did the gods do this, right? And I think this is something I think about a lot. We are on a journey that's been prescribed to us and we're very lucky people. And you take advantage of the moments. You take advantage of the opportunity to make change, to be changed, to be changed. How extraordinary is that idea, right? And, and I feel the changes in my life. I feel every step of the way, every challenge. The, the real lessons have been in the things that have not gone well, right? <laughs> That's the real lesson. In I, the I can't believe yeah. things have not gone well. <laughs> no, they, you know what? You know what's so funny is when you when I'm in the American Regional Theater, so I get produced a lot in these you know ridiculous theaters all over the country, and I love them. But you know, every once in a while, somebody'll say something, and you're like, "Oh my God, that is a terrible review." And then the same play in the New York Times is pick of the week, and then you're like, "I know." It's I know. all. It's all right. It's like it's all just a point of view and it's all everybody sees it in a different way. And the joy of art is that we're meant to be interpreted. We're meant to be, you know, to to tell these stories and let people decide on their own. That's right. What to, what to make of them. Right. So I'm I'm very lucky. I feel very, very lucky. I feel the opportunity has arisen every time for me to not only do my work, but also to create community around it. And that is that is the extraordinary part about being 
alive right now in this moment. You and I both lived through a moment of, you know, we lived through the AIDS crisis. How many friends did we lose then, right? And so we know what a pandemic is. I feel like in a way I knew how to deal with this pandemic because sure. I had been through it before, right? So I, I think that's one of the extraordinary parts about being an artist is that we're circular, right? We understand totally. this. And, and that continues always. I mean, I'm 81 and I, and I feel exactly the same. And my thoughts are like they were when I was in my 20s. You think I'd have learned something along the way. And, <laughs> but, but honestly, it's like it feels the same. You're still looking for your next gig and, and that contact. And you're still, you know, doing what you do. And, uh, but and don't you think that you're, you know, one of the things I just have to say, not to blow smoke up your butt, but I have to say, Dan, you're so graceful. You know, there's something very, there's, there's an energy that you give off to the world that is so powerful, right? I, I'm, I'm getting emotional here, but just to say, you know, I have followed your path. I am here because you were there, right? I see you and I know that what's possible because you've paved a way too, right? And so there's something extraordinary about how we grow in grace. We grow in intelligence. The arc is not in age. The arc is in wisdom, right? The arc is at all the beautiful things you know and i hope that that's what we're celebrated for as we get older and older my god you're 81 i'm 105 come on <laughs> please <laughs> thank you for that thank you for that um i want to play something we're, we're, we're going to stay in the in the uh those uh, early poetry days um this is an audio clip uh that i think is going to take you back and then i want you to tell me about that that young voice you hear and what what it brings back for you um can we have that abelardo angel baby saw him on the huggy boy show huggy boy was better than american bandstand or soul tray because it was on five times a week monday through friday channel 52 out of corona before the little rascals kimba or even speed racer and always right after school Ran a mile down Pico from Barando Junior High just in time to see Mr. Oldie's Art LeBeau introduce the Oldie of the Week, which was always Angel Baby, until I got older and it turned into Always and Forever. Better than American Bandstand or Soul Train because it was all Mexican, and sometimes you saw a cholo from down the street or my cousins from El Sereno waving big tattoos and little Chinese eyes made out of big bandanas worn too low on the forehead. And sometimes if he could sneak out of school, I could see my brother in his dark blue khakis riding low on the hip, just like he taught me to wear them. But my mom says no and gives me Miller's outpost corduroys and wallaby shoes from Kinney's in hopes that they'll leave me alone to study. Wow. What does that do? What are you thinking? I loved watching your face as you listen to that. <laughs> well, I, I haven't heard that in about 30 years or something, so that's amazing. You know what I'm thinking about? Uh, one of the joys of writing poetry back then, especially being so specific about my growing up and my experiences, was many years later, like 25 years later, Art LeBeau calls me up. <laughs> and, he, and he says, somebody sent me this angel baby poem you wrote. Uh -huh. And I think, and I want to send it to Rosie of Rosie and the Originals, right? Angel baby. And he said, would you, would you sign it for her? No thing. And then she called me up. And it was so, she lived in San Diego at the time, and it was so powerful because, you know, I grew up with Art LeBeau in the Central Valley. I, you know, when we'd go to Fresno to visit the cousins and we would all on Sundays, we would all just sit in the yard because it was so hot. And you'd be having, you know, my grandmother's lemonade and Art LeBeau doing the, you know, the oldies and the, you know, people doing all of their, their, their song wishes and everything. So I just think about that period and I think, wow, what an amazing time. I felt free. I was really, really free. I was you taking. Sound, you sound like you're 12 years old. You sound so. I was young. so young. I was so young, and I, you know what I was doing? I was taking. I was going downtown to the Greyhound station, and I would take the bus down to San Diego because there was lots of places to read poetry back then. And then I would take the bus up to San Francisco because there was lots of places to read poetry back then too. And I would just go back and forth every weekend. I would save my money from my job at the factory in Vernon, and then on the weekends I would go on these Amtrak trips you know or these greyhound trips and and i would do read poetry at like little coffee houses and bookstores and so somehow you know 
the, the, in the act of doing, you become something, right? In yes. the act, in the repetition of it, you become not only the artist, but you become yourself. You become a version of yourself. So I think about that a lot. You know, that period, just my voice. It doesn't make me cringe. It just reminds me of that guy. Sure. That kid. Yeah, and all those trips, all those bookstores, and all those lovely people. And, you know, there's a woman named Eloise de Leon who is now in New York, but she ran Centro Cultura de la Plaza in Balboa Park. You know, in San Diego, sure. and she would she would bring me down for like Dia de la Mujer, Dia de la Gente, Dia de los you know, Dia de Tabale, whatever. Yes, <laughs> totally. And she'd say, "Do you have a poem for this?" I'd say, "Of course I do. I'm writing it on the bus, right?" So, but you know, it, like it was amazing to to be that supported. You know, beautiful. Now let me ask you this: What did your first of all? You paint such a vivid, vivid portrait. <laughs> In Angel Baby, there you you can see it all and feel it all, um, and 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 I want to know a what your parents thought of all this because your 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 parent you grew up in a very religious I mean seriously religious your mother was Pentecostal your father Catholic, and and what did they think of all this madness? Well, you know, Pentecostal, we were an apostolic church, which is in Lincoln Heights. It was a Spanish-speaking church. And it was very, very intense, speaking in tongues, you know, and full-on baptisms and all that. So the legacy of that was that we were, the beautiful part of it is that the one thing I've taken from that religion even now is service. We were a service religion. You gave back. You know, when I was a kid, you know, we spent our Sundays at hospitals visiting the ill or we were at a mortuary. You know, we were the ushers, right, at somebody's funeral, right? So there was always that going on. Uh, my father, oh, my father, I think, was terrified that I was that I was an artist. And I think by extension, he was terrified that I was queer. And you know what my trick was? I said to my father, there's a calling and it's called being an artist. And it's like the same calling that you get when you're a priest. Yes. And, I, and my parents didn't know how to respond to that. Uh -huh. So I think what happened is that they were like, oh, okay. So they yeah. were the, the chief. They were able to relate to that, to that reasoning. You know, I saw four plays when I was a kid that changed. My first four plays were all at the music center. And I still remember what they were. It was Stephen Sondheim's Specific Overtures, the mm -hmm. first national tour from Broadway with Mako. It was for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is right. left by Entosake Shange. It was The Wiz, the first national tour with Ren Woods. And you know what the fourth play was? It was the world premiere of Zoot Suit. And all four of those plays... My parents drove me to the music center. They sat in the car and waited for me while I saw the plays. And, I, and the only way I got there was I had to collect bottles and cans, right? I had to buy my own ticket. And um, I still remember that my parents were such, I, I see them as part of that, even though they didn't sit in the audience. They made those experiences happen for me. Yes. Right? Yes. How extraordinary, right? Totally. Uh, That's so beautiful. That's yeah, my mom, I was just today, I, I wrote something yesterday on Facebook about my mom drove me to see, you know, um, Barbara Morrison, who just passed, a great jazz singer. Nancy Wilson, Nina Simone. My mother drove me to see Nina Simone. My God. You know, I, and one night I, I, w I went to the Universal Amphitheater when it was still open air amphitheater. Right, right. And I had, I had only read about this lady. I didn't know who she was. I said to my mom, everybody loves her. You got to take me. So it was... Joni Mitchell. So I go to see Joni uh -huh. Mitchell and I walk out and I'm like the most obnoxious, overbearing, like 15 year old. Right. And I buy a, be a beret <laughs> and I'm only speaking in French accent. And my parents are like so over me. And I'm saying, I'm a free man and I'm moving to Paris. And I had this whole idea. And my parents were like, you know, but, um, but, you know, they gave me that gift. They gave me the gift of art. They gave me the gift of culture. They gave me the gift of expression, right? That is, an, that's a great gift. But that's extraordinary, considering what their background was. And they never went to the theater. They never went to the concerts. My mother went to one play. And <laughs> it was only because it was Phantom of the Opera at the Amundsen. And you know why she went? Because it was the replacement Phantom. It was uh, Robert Guillaume. And my mother said, oh, Benson is in it? OK, I'll go see it. <laughs> The power of television, <laughs> right? In the theater. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So you know that it's it's. I think that my parents probably lived, you know, maybe a lot of their dreams through through, sure, through sure. what I was doing, right? But I got the I was that generation that got the opportunity to do that, and you know, I always think of my father. I invoke him. You know, I, I every time I do a poetry reading, I welcome the ancestors into the space. 
But I welcome my parents. My father's right here still, right? Irene Fornes is right here. You welcome those people into the space because they're always with you. There is a very thin line that separates us. And um, that is the beauty of, of, um, of w what it means to be Chicano and what it means to be a Mexicano, to have one foot on each side of the border, right? But also that border is a spiritual one, right? And I love that. I love that about who we are as a people and what we're capable of doing. Our possibility is extraordinary, right? Extraordinary. You mentioned uh, 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 Oedipus a bit ago, and I think it's time that we say congratulations because fancy schmancy, this book, <laughs> what happened? Oh, no, I, I don't want that yet. <laughs> this, this book, get this, ladies and gentlemen of the ensemble. I want to read this because I want to get it right. Okay. All right. This book, the Greek trilogy of Ruiz Alfaro, just won, get this, uh, very recently, March 28th to be, that's pretty recent, the big winner at the 24th London Hellenic Prize Ceremony held there at King's College. This is an international award uh, event that was founded in 1996 to recognize original works inspired by the Hellenic civilization, a global event, and this trio of Greek to Chicano adaptations took the prize. Come on. How cool is that? It, right? it was it was extraordinary, you know. The the other the guy I was up against, I love a guy named Stephen Fry, who was a great writer, the great British writer, right? And I was like, oh my god! But we we didn't even think we would get near the the editor is a wonderful woman named Rosa Andujar, a Latina living in from the Bronx who's living in London. And I remember when she called me, she says, "You're not going to believe this, but we're nominated. It's a Greek. It's nominated in Greece." So there was all these articles in Greek, right? And then the prize is given in London. And uh, I mean, it's just unbelievable, man. Damn it opinion. is. I I'm mean, so think about it. What would Sophocles think of this? He and his pals. What would they think of this? <laughs> well, they would say, like, you know, the gods have spoken, right? I mean, <laughs> honestly, I mean, it's just, I can't believe the blessings that I live with you know, in my life, it's now this had to, I mean, you've been honored many, many, just Google and you, you, <laughs> you could choke a horse, but this had to be quite, quite unique. I mean, it had to be very special for you, I would think. Yeah. You know, I think what was really powerful is writing those plays, you know, I wrote those plays out of community need and want, and then having seen those plays, you know, be premiered around the country. Um, I think, you know, one of them, like, like they said, that's now been performed like 46 different productions and Oedipus is on its 30th. And, you know, I think what's amazing is by the time we, we went off Broadway with both Mojada and Oedipus, I had already had like 10 years of journey with these plays, right? So it's just amazing to see that writing is living. Uh, the w language is like a mushroom. It's a living, breathing organism. And this book, you know, is a living, breathing organism because people still read it and perform it. And just this last week in Fresno, uh, Fresno State did Alexisiad. So I was just like, we, oh, my we God. Have, we have photos of that. We have two photos. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I want to get them in here. Now really? I'm in Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's, this is Oedipus at the public, right? At the public. Do you see that mural in the back? That's a famous mural in East L.A. And I convinced the, the muralist to let us take the image of the mural. And I found uh, a, a graffiti artist in New York who recreated the mural. Oh, exact. my God. Who was the artist? Uh, oh, man, it's not going to it's not going to hit me right away because okay. of just too many people. Wow. Yeah, that was and amazing. And then electricidad, this was at Fresno, I believe. This must have been, yeah, just recent. I didn't get to go see the production, but they were so nice. I mean, the kids were just so thrilled and so happy. And, I, you know, it's a community building exercise, right? I mean, it's, yeah. been, a, it's been a journey because, you know, it's, I'm not writing uh, plays that are, I write comedies, but this is not, these are not comedies. And. These are hard plays about issues in our culture, but, you know, gang violence, yes. the, pri the prison system, undocumented in our in our country. So, you know, I've really, this would be issues that sit inside of me and I obsess about. And so sometimes, you know, audiences are very angry about them. You know, not everybody loves these. But I, but I do think it's important to tell our story, to be honest. And our story is a very, very varied and diverse and beautiful tale 
good and bad that needs to be told, right? So I'm just so happy with this and the reception has been incredible. And, you know, I, I, I have nothing to complain about, right? I'll okay. say, except that hotel room in uh, Chicago. But, <laughs> but let me ask you this, because I... Uh, I may be confused. It's very possible. But um, I, you were at Borderlands doing Electricidad when you bought a book of 10 classic Greek plays for 10 bucks. Is that what led to the full trilogy? That was the first play. So what happened is that I do, every time I do, I go to a different city. I had about a 10-year period. Was I would not recommend this to anybody. But I had a 10-year period where I went to live in a different city in America. Usually a city that's going through some sort of challenge. So I lived like in Houston, Texas. I was in Hartford, Connecticut. And in Tucson, I was working with Borderlands. And right. Barkley Goldsmith, the great from Borderlands, sent me yeah. off to work with these girls in a, a correctional facility, 12 to 17 year old girls. And I met a, a young girl who had murdered her mother. She was 13 years old and murdered the mother who had put a hit out on the dad who was a drug dealer from the south side of Tucson. And that night I went to see a play at the Arizona Theater Company called The Mystery of Irma Vep. Remember that play? It's a comedy. And, um, and they have a little bookstore. And in the bookstore, they had a collection of 10 Greeks for $10. Dollar a Greek, you know, pretty good. And so... <laughs> the dance, dollar a Greek. <laughs> there you go. So the first play I read was Electra, the story of a young girl who murders her mother to avenge her father's death. And I went, oh my God. 1,200 years ago, and we're still, Bingo. as a culture, still, why do we still have gangs? Why, or why do we still have these, the same desire to avenge? So then these questions start to pop up, right? And each one has been a journey. I did a little residency at North Current State Prison, and that's when I started writing about prisons. And then Father Greg Boyle, who's been a great, great yeah, inspiration. He's the, best. he's the best. Yeah, so Homeboy Industries was very helpful with Electricity, very helpful with Oedipus. And then, you know, the most moving thing is that um, they did Mojada up at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And one day, when I, get a, I get a note, uh, an email, and it, said, and it was Father Greg. And he says, I was in Portland, and I was going to visit a prison. And they had a riot, so they didn't let me go in. So I, they made me turn back. And I was driving back to California, and I stopped in Ashland. And, and they, I saw that your play was going to be on. <laughs> So I saw your play. So Father Greg has seen all of the Greek plays of mine and has you know, worked on them in one way or another. How amazing is that? How beautiful. I, no accidents. No, no accidents. accidents. G-Dog, he's a great man. He's a great man. What he's done there at the mission. Uh, yeah. At the mission there. Um, you have a new, I, I, I don't want to forget, go to Amazon. It's fantastic because it's not only the plays, but it's a wonderful interview that your editor did with you. And there's a, a production background on each of the plays. It's terrific. Mine's a little ragged because I used it for, for research, but you'll have to sign this before I croak from my collection. <laughs> my, um, what did I want to do? I wanted to ask you. Oh, yeah. So you have this new gig at the Music Center as Associate Artistic Director at the Center Theater Group, which is full circle for you. You have a long, long history with uh, the, the Center Theater Group. You call it your artistic home. Yes, well, you know, my first four plays, and then, I, believe it or not, I was an usher there. And the reason I became an usher there when I was in high school was that that was the only way I was going to afford to see all the plays. So that's, I saw every single play. I saw, you know, in all the big ones, like Evita and all of that, Sweeney Todd with Angela Lansbury, you know, all of them, like 32 times each, right? Because that was that, that was who I am. And then, uh, and then, you know, Diane Rodriguez, God bless her soul, uh, her and I ran the Latino Theater Initiative. I have a years. photo I took of oh, the theater here. <laughs> I remember that night. It was the night of her, of her of opening of her play. That's right. That's yeah. right. Uh, that's so beautiful. Sweetheart deal. Sweetheart that's right. Deal. That, at LATC. I, I thought to myself, I know I took a picture of the two of them because I'm in a lot of them with you all, but I, <laughs> I wanted one of just the two of you. Oh, so. yeah. So, you know, Diane and I had a, a very fruitful and intense and powerful. And, you know, at the very end, you know, we had a really beautiful coming back together. That yeah. crazy, you know, like New Year's Eve parties. And, yeah. but, you know, I had a very lovely beautiful re reuni reunion with Diane at the end that was really powerful and 
Yeah, so, you know, I was there for 10 years. And then, so then, you know, Michael Ritchie. Oh, wait, before, before you go way too far, because I, 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 you and, and, and I uh, uh, co, were co-directors of the Latino Initiative there. Uh, at that time, the, the, the taper had uh, Black, uh, I guess, Asian. Asian. Uh, Native American and four. I think there were four. And, and, uh, and a program for disabled artists. That's Which right. Was really, really and that was all under Gordon Davidson, who was a brilliant gentleman. Uh, yeah. And then when the new regime came in, uh, Michael Ritchie, who's now yeah. leaving, they all went away. And uh, and that's when the, there was some fiction with you and Di, but it all came together. But how did you all feel when, when all those went away? I mean, they were such an important part. I mean, well, you know, with like you say, nothing is nothing is really an accident. What it did for me was, even though I was terribly saddened by the fact that he had killed all these major programs in LA and never, never in his entire 17 years, he's a lovely man, but never in his 17 years paid attention to Los Angeles. So, you know, uh, last year in the middle of the pandemic, I just couldn't take it anymore. And I just wrote him a letter because he's a nice man. I love his wife is a very dear friend of mine, Kate Burton. And, and a so, wonderful actress, wonderful. Just actress. a really great friend. And so, you know, I, I said, you know, Kate, I'm going to write Michael a letter, so just be ready. But I wrote him a letter and I said, what are you doing? Something is really wrong here. And he said, come in, let's talk. And I went in and he said, what would you do? And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to write a proposal and I'm going to show you what I would do. I'm going to write a five-page proposal of all the things I, I would do if I was here again. And then, you know, I'm a professor at USC, so I already have yes. a full-time job. And he said... Um, Okay, come. I'll hire you, full time. You have to come and do it. And then I said, "Oh my God!" So I took a sabbatical from USC. I'll have to go back in August. But um, I've spent I didn't the realize last... it was full time. I thought it was part. Yeah, of... I'm mean, no. I've pr I'm producing shows. I'm picking this this next season. I've picked the uh -huh. season with the staff, and I've um, I you know I brought in the first show that opened the Douglas season, Alma by Benjamin Benet. Yes. Um, you know, so yeah, no, I got really involved in, and I took the writers group which is an extraordinary writers group, and I expanded it from six writers to ten writers, all women, all women of color in Los Angeles. And we're going to do it very differently now. So, you know, um, who knows? Uh, a new artistic director will be chosen in August, and maybe I'll be gone in, in a few months, or maybe not. So the thing is, listen, when the moment arises and you know you can make change, go in there and make Rabbit. the change. Make it, because you know what? We are very lucky in Los Angeles. We have seven regional theaters in the West Coast, in our area, in our region, right? Yeah. South yeah. Coast Rep, Pasadena Playhouse, the Geffen, La Jolla. You know, we have so many. Um, all of them run by very wonderful, very competent, very nice white men. We are 49% of the population and none of the leadership of the arts institutions of the theater. None, none of the leadership. We are in a county of 10 million people who speak 224 different languages. We need to see that in the leadership of our city. Civic, civic leadership requires the right people in those positions, the people that represent the city. If we are in fact half of the population of the city, where are we in the civic discourse that's going on? So that's why I went back. I said, listen, if you'll hire me, and I'll come in here, and I'm going to make very quick change. Not that I don't love all the people that, I, that I'm working with and all the leadership that exists, but we have to be in there. Our voice has to be in there because you don't see us in there. You don't see us represented on a consistent basis at these theaters. But I'm at USC where I'm 2% of the, of the tenured faculty of that entire university, 65,000 people. Only 2% are Latino. 1% are black. This is unacceptable. So at a certain point, we have to decide how we use our activism and how we use our voice for great change. And we can be great diplomats. We can be great ambassadors. Dan, you are a great example of that. I've never seen you be, you know, a mean person and I've seen you make great change. So I know that we can be great ambassadors and we can, be, we can, we can make great change at the same time. That is what I'm intending to do. I'm going to kill them with kindness. 
<laughs> yeah, but, right. You, know, you created your that own your own opportunity there, and that's so important, especially for our young people. You know, you can't sit and wait for that phone to ring or see if the job comes up. You've got to make your own opportunities more than ever. And in this day and age, there yeah, are right. the tools. You know, when when we were doing it, there you had to type a resume and send it off. But now, all the platforms, and uh, you know, you, you can create your own art. You don't have to wait for for someone to bring it on and let's face it we're most impressed by the person by the person who does it themselves and then we want them we want them in the institution i am most impressed by you know this play that i just produced this young artist of some sienda heights he got himself he came from an undocumented family in hacienda side he got himself to yale drama school and you know what? He's not even done with school, and I've just given him his first professional production. We are welcoming him into the field while he's still in school. This is amazing, and it's amazing. major. But you know what's more and more, more amazing? That he got himself there. He worked himself through Cal State Fullerton to Yale Drama School. I want to support this young man, and I want him to know that there is a place in Los Angeles for his story and that his, he has many stories to tell, right? So his journey begins as an artist. We can do that. We can do that. But I'm most impressed by his, his own self-determination, his ability to make that happen, right? To dream it forward and to believe it and then to conjure it. And that's what he did. He conjured yes. it, yes. right? Yes, conjuring is very important. I totally believe that. I once too long more to go into, but the the the, the punchline is I got on a plane somewhere, and there was uh, uh, Hinojosa, como se llama? You know? Um, yeah, yeah. Why have I blanked on her first name? You know who I mean? Yeah, of course, of course. And I had been wanting to reach her, wanting to reach her. Wow, my God. And I got, and she was sitting on the plate, and I went up to her and I said, I conjured you up. That's the exact word I use. And she goes, What and what? But yeah, so you can conjure it. I totally believe in that. Now, your, your mentoring and your teaching uh, spreads far and wide, not just within the, the classroom. And there are so many national and local initiatives and organizations these days, theater groups uh, like the Latinx Theater Commons and the Soul Project which is New York based, which you've been involved in. I think we have a photo there. Tell us about this, this, this new uh, movement it's, going on in these last several years. It, it's amazing. So the guy way on the left is Jacob Padron from uh, Gilroy, California. I love Jacob, right? Because he came up to the Teatro Capesino. He now runs the Long Wharf Theater in New Haven. Ah. And, and Jacob started this organization. And their, their goal is to get a Latino play every season in an off-Broadway theater or around the country until there are, you know, like 12 seasons of this work done. And so they've been incredibly successful. So I was the second play in the off-Broadway season. So what we did is, and this is how weird our industry is, Dan, I'm just going to tell you really quick. Jacob said, you know, we, we got to convince the public to do it. This. And the one reason why they're not going to do it is that they, it's not that they don't believe in Latino work. They just don't have the money for your play. And so he said, but we know a lawyer. And there was a lawyer in Washington, D.C. who invests money in socially conscious plays, a white guy. So we, we found the guy, guess through who? Lynn Miranda. Lynn oh. Manuel Miranda. Yeah, there's who, a, wow. Who, who turned us on to this guy. And then because of him, we found this lawyer who paid for the production. And then, you know what, he, the lawyer, we went into a meeting with Oscar Eustace, I'll never forget this, and the guy said, if you produce Mojada the second season, which they never do, right? They never bring an artist back right away that fast. He goes, I'll pay for that production too. Oh my God. <laughs> and that's, wow. how I, that's how I got two plays off Broadway that got, were big critical successes, right? Uh, wow. through, through the generosity of this thread. This, you know, that's, that includes Lynn manuel Miranda, but also Jacob Padron, Lori Woolery, all of these artists in that collective who do the activism, who do the work, you know, to get these theaters off Broadway to produce these plays. How amazing is that? And now the public theater is a home of mine, and I've always loved being there. But it's just full of so much... Um, possibility that's the thing right that you got to open yourself up to that and believe in it and it doesn't always happen and there's always disappointment in our art too but uh but there's there's a lot of joy right don't wait don't wait there's no reason to wait right the moment 
is now for you, and you decide how to get it out there, right? That's the grab way you do it. it. Grab it. Make your opportunity and grab it. That's what I did for, you know, 30 years, right? Just made my own zines, my own collectives. And sometimes own... on roller skates. <laughs> in a black slip. Remember, yeah. I was in a black slip. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I, do. A... I was dying you... for a photo of that, but I couldn't find it. Uh, I no, that. I have it deep, deep down in my, <laughs> my drawer. You know, I got to the black slip because I went to Mexico City and, and all the poetry in Mexico City one night. I was this guy with this all these famous, famous poets, but it was so... Uh, my machismo right it was so like down with women you know it's very interesting so i just that night i went to the mercado and i found a, a little store for gorditas and i found a black slip and i thought i'm gonna read my poetry in a black slip in mexico city in spanish and so people were shocked right it caused a stir and then some some of the journalists even confused it and they called me the transvestite poet <laughs> so they just missed, they missed the point altogether but you know what was great about it is that it taught me a lesson every time i every time i go to a queer space i always open with something chicano and every time i go to a chicano space i always open with something queer and somehow we are part and central to the story of our community and we claim our space, right? We claim our space. And how many of us have been part of the movement for so very long, right? And I think about, I think about the March on Washington and seeing Cesar Chavez there, right? For human rights. Um, we are capable of creating coalition. We are capable of extending that hand to our brothers and sisters who are not us because we learn from each other movements get made by modeling for each other right so each one of us has a role in, in helping build a world for everybody else not just chicanos but everybody right and this new generation of of of, of latin x i guess that's what we are today I, it's hard to keep up they just they just inspire me you know when i was playing a lot of universities with, with my solo show and i'd meet these young people and they were like ah, they were out there I, I i have such hope for this this next generation that will uh, uh carry the torch that you uh, have lit and so many foreigners all those people uh you know, I, I, I just very proud of them. I really am. You know, what's amazing is this this today. Uh, I'm in Chicago, but this weekend, South Coast Rep is doing, you know, a festival of new plays, right? They call it PPF. And there's a guy in there, Michael Cheyenne, who's Persian from Beverly Hills, who's doing a piece that he was in my class, right? And another guy, Noah Gardner, who was Hawaiian. They are they are extensions of us these students are extensions of us they are the next generation of us right and i love that mentorship apprenticeship internship all of those are essential for us i came up because irene fornes let me sit in a million classes i came up right. because right. paula vogel let me sit in all her workshops right i came up through all of those people, through all of those poetry workshops. And I toured for the longest time with Guillermo Gomez Peña. Oh my God. Oh, I, that was the most drunken. You lived drunken. Tell the tale. You lived oh my God. I was, I, it, it's such a haze of, of alcohol. I don't remember. But, but you know what? That was, that was an amazing mentorship. He took so much care of me. And he taught me lessons about how to perform and how to prepare, and how to be disciplined. And he doesn't look like a disciplined man, but he is a very, very disciplined man. How to get to the performance, how to create the space, how to ground yourself. And, you know, sometimes, you you know, we go into college universities and everything's crazy, and they're trying to figure out the lights, and you're just trying to, you know, ground yourself. And th we learn that. We learn how to do this through the maestros, through the mentors, they show us, they, they, they mirror for us how to be not only great artists, but great people, right? That's important. Very important. You mentioned South Coast Rep. We're going to have to get to Q&A in a minute, but we could talk for five more hours. Um, <laughs> they, that Christine Quintana, do you know, I, and she's got this play, Clean Espejos, which is bilingual. It's not and great. It's supposed to be wonderful, and, and the subtitles are built into the design of the set i read some wonderful things about it i don't it's, i don't think it, she's she sounds like she's amazing because she's uh mexicana but she was born born in la but it lives in canada 
I just love that. You know, I love that there are ways that we can experience language. I always remember one of my favorite performances at the Wiltern was uh, Zulu Macbeth. Where you saw uh -huh. the, where you just saw the on the LED board some of the Shakespeare, but not very much of it. And you know, you start l just listening to people speaking in this African language, and you're like, you know what? You get I it. Get, I get it. Yeah. I get it. In the same way that you know, you go and now when you listen to somebody speak in Spanish, you get it, right? And you you hear. I live in Koreatown. I listen to Koreans, and they're talking, and you get it. You know, so language is the least of it is we are in the business of emotion. We are in the business of feelings. And when you look at the classic text, they're so emotional for a reason, for a reason. They lead with feeling, need and want, desire. Those are Chicano words. Those are our words, right? Desire, need, want, romance, all of that. So I think that, you know, the lesson here is you can go see a play now and, and have it subtitled, or maybe not. You know, my favorite production of, of Mojada was an actress who was deaf. And, oh. they, and I went and I was thinking they were going to translate my language, and they never did. So I was like, oh, my God, I'm so offended. And then I was like, oh, my God, I don't care. This actress is doing the length, you know, with her hands and her body. And she's giving, she's creating. The you don't need the text. You understand the text. The text is the opportunity for her to emote. And everybody else is talking around her. So you get the story she, that's being told. How extraordinary to have another language, American Sign Language which we should all know, right? Um, so, I mean, if you've seen CODA, you know, you understand that, right? Yeah. So uh, this is really, really important because I think of us for so many years, they wouldn't let us into these spaces because they said language was the barrier. There's no barrier in language. Not no, anymore. They, but they're still fighting. They still fight that damn tired old song you're still singing. Well, white supremacy is a system. It's not people. The system is rotted. The system is holding on for its life. The system is very, very scared, and it's built on fear. And fear is what makes rage and anger and all of that. But the system is what needs to be changed, not the people, right? If you change the system, the people have to change. So this is what I learned, right? When you're in these, in these institutions where, you know, they talk, about, they talk about the plays they want to do. It's not about saying, we need to do a Latino play. What is the story we're telling? You know what I do now? My new, my new trick is I walk in and say, who isn't in this room? So in my writer's group, it's the most diverse group they've ever had. And you know what I say to the group? We don't have a Middle Eastern writer here. And the Middle Eastern community of Los Angeles is big. We don't have a Central American writer in here. That is a fault of our own. But you know who we don't have in this room that we really need? There are 65,000 unhoused homeless people in Los Angeles. Many of them are very, very smart uh, artists themselves. We need an unhoused artist to be in this room, and then this, then this group will be complete, right? So who, who isn't in the room? Who is not in the room? That is the way you start to unfold and unpack a story. Who is not with us today? That makes a difference, right? So I'm always conscious about who isn't in the room. And sometimes I'm in rooms where I'm like, oh, my God, I'm the only person of color. Often I am in a company, I'll be very transparent, I am in a company where there's only two people of color in entire leadership of the organization, a young black man and myself. The room is not big enough. We need to expand the room because we're not telling the story of Los Angeles until we expand the room. <laughs> I, I could talk on and on and i bet people writing in questions could go another hour as well but we do have to give them a, a chance i'll reason thank you so 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 much thank you so much you'll have to come back it's always a joy to be with you dan i adore you you know i adore you i adore thank you, you so much <laughs> let's get some q a here i'll be a lot weren't you was that riveting or what incredible <laughs> thank you so much to luis and, and to dan uh dan for bringing luis on luis for being here with us tonight a lot of great uh, comments here on on the chat uh david acosta joined us chris franco of course roberta martinez terence butcher uh Tim Miller. Tim Miller has a question. He says, Luis, what will be your next play to be staged in L.A.? 
Oh my god, it's so hard to get staged in LA. My next play is actually happening at the um, at the Magic Theater in San Francisco, the theater that Sam Shepard built, and it's a great home. It's run by Sean San Jose, or my Filipino brother, and um, a company that he built called Campo Santo. So I'm very, very proud of that space. I've done a lot of plays there. I wrote a play about the Central Valley about Latino men who are in a seminary. And it was based on a true story of a young farm worker who joined a seminary, then he hung himself. And a lot of men joined the seminary to get out of the, the backbreaking work of the fields, right? Uh -huh. And during the drought, a lot of people were trying to figure out, you know, everything was shifting and changing, right, when the droughts first started. So it's a very hard story, and it takes place in a little town called Grangeville near Hanford. California. So I'm telling the story. It's called The Travelers, and it's about a young brother who comes in, and we realize that the, the guy who is least resistant to religion and spirituality is maybe the most spiritual person in the room, <laughs> which I think happens often, right? Is the most profane is actually the most, you know, the most sacred, right? So, and, and you know, I have to say that as a gay man, I think about that marriage of the sacred and the profane, right? Of bringing those two elements together. So I'm excited about that. So I'm going to do that. And then I've, uh, uh, I'm working with the Getty again and another Greek. And, and, uh, and then I'm going up to Denver to do a piece about Chicanos and the freeways, which I think will be interesting to all of us because in Denver... They've built a number of freeways that have intersected right through all these Chicano neighborhoods. Sound familiar? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. So it's all about gentrification. And, um, and uh, I read the story of a young uh, a family that lost their restaurant, their, their, their family restaurant, because the city did uh, eminent domain, right, where they take the, they take the property and, and pay you what the market rate is. Mm -hmm. But a really terrible story of like, you know, we're in, are we in the way of progress or is progress in the way of us, right? So, yeah, so I love play. I mean, you know, I'll write forever, right? I'll just keep writing until I die. Yes, of course, of course. Absolutely. All right, well, that's all we have. We, well, we have Tim Miller. He says, didn't you do a stage reading of it during the pandemic? But I, I don't know which one he's. Yeah, I did. I did for the Ojai Playwrights Conference. I've been involved with Ojai Playwrights Conference since 2002. And um, so that was a great place to develop work. And I, I just really loved it. It was really wonderful. And I got to work with, you know, all the, these great Latino uh, writer, uh, actors in L.A. that I adore. Just a group of great, great artists. Uh, L.A. is full of great talent. And we don't exploit it. We don't use it. We don't. We don't uh, employ it enough. You know. But um, we have a great, great community of artists that we need to use more and often, for sure. All right. Well, that that's it for the questions. But uh, like I said, lots of comics. Uh, Chris Franco is asking, what can a writer do to get a commission? Um, well, you know, now commissions are very strange things. I'll be really honest. At that theater, at the Music Center, you know, they look eastward often. So a lot of the commissions are writers who are in New York. And my goal is to change how we think about commissions. So one of the ways that I'm doing it is who are the emerging writers, who are the mid-career writers, and who are the veteran writers in our community? And can we commission one or many from each category. So that we don't forget the emerging, we don't forget the young writers, but we also don't forget this group of writers that have been working for a long the time. Veteranos, the veteranos. We have to honor that voice. So I will, my one secret about next season is there's a, you know, when we announce next season at the Mark Taper Forum, I'm very excited because there is the veterano, there is the mid-career, and this, there is the emerging. And I'm very excited about that. To honor, it's a season of all women. So to honor women, and also a women who have been in the field for many, many years, is very, very exciting. I have a question. The, the Center Theater Group did, uh, di they digitally, uh, they did the staging of Electricidad and uh, Oedipus, El Rey, right, from live from the Kirk Douglas, and it was streamed. Is that going to be repeated? You know what? I It was such an amazing moment, but the Getty, uh, the Getty had, had was going to give me a commission right at the start of the pandemic, and then what happened is, before we could sign the contract, the pandemic hit and the Getty shut down. 
right. all of its business, all of it. So I never got that commission. So um, the Ralph Flores, who I adore up at the Getty, said, you know, we have some money and, and we don't, do you want to do something with it? And I said, why don't we do a COVID safe a series of live streams for schools because for kids like to to get in their classroom so yeah. we hired actors we hired directors and we did it very safe in these bubbles no audience right and we did them at the kirk douglas theater the rule was because it's actors equity because we're a professional union house you can only show it so many times and then you can't oh show it. yeah yeah so you know what happens is the live stream you can't do live streams over so many performances because yeah. then you're exploiting the actor right so i'm okay with that because a lot of schools got it and i'm hoping that you know you hold on to them and i'm hoping at some point actors equity will come back and say hey why don't you just offer it to schools anytime they want yes just, you know yeah that would be great but you know i think it's always um as as much as i want to be poo-pooing the union i actually think that's a smart thing to protect the actor to protect the, all the artists involved so that we don't exploit them and just take their work out and put it on youtube without them being compensated for it right so yeah, there you go true 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 Anyway, if you had your jammies, we could keep on talking, but it's uh, two hours later there, right? Are we going to are we gonna toast? Because I just keep drinking without you. Yes, <laughs> I'm here toasting you, you beautiful. Okay. Beautiful well, t will I bring it up so I can hit it? There you go. <laughs> Here's to you, kid. Here's to us. I love you, Louise. Thank you so, so much. When you come back to L.A., let's wear masks and have a drink. Yes, I'm ready to go to Bottega Louis with you. I have a feeling that would be a very fun experience. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I love it. I love it. I've never loved okay, it. Okay, my uh, friends. Well, greetings from Chicago. It's snowing and it's beautiful. July. It's snowing and it's 30 degrees. I'm dying. I am it, really dying. It was I'm 99 here today <laughs> in L.A. <laughs> Can you believe that? No, 90 fucking nine. Oh, can you say fucking out? Well, it was 99. <laughs> You said it, you said it, Dan. All right. Thank you, Luis. Dad, you. end with your middle finger because you didn't just you didn't do that either. <laughs> but, right, right. Bless you. I, bless I hope, you. I, I hope the new CEO at La Plaza is not watching tonight. <laughs> I love you guys. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Good night, Bye, my friends. Good night, Dan. Bye, Thank you. Lot of Thanks all, to all of you that joined us tonight for this incredible conversation. Uh, thank you, Luis. That, that was insightful and entertaining the whole gamut uh thanks to all of you that joined us tim miller david acosta chris franco roberta martinez uh all of you that joined us on on facebook who le aren't letting me know who you are but that's cool you know we'll find out sooner or later anyway if you uh didn't catch the entire program please uh or you want to watch it again it will be posting that on our youtube page at la plaza la uh it's also on our facebook page at la plaza la and also on our website lapca.org i mentioned earlier about a fundraiser that we're hosting tomorrow uh here it is it's anna in the tropics there a noise within in pasadena it's on saturday april 9th uh a luncheon reception at 12 o'clock followed by a the two o'clock matinee performance now we have something special going on here at la plaza de cultura y artes two tickets for tomorrow's performance of Ananda Tropics as part of the fundraiser to the first person on either Zoom or Facebook that writes down their name. So here, I'll give you a, a minute or two. Please just jot down your name. If you can go, please don't take the tickets and not go because that's not nice. Uh, so let's see, any takers, any takers? Okay, well, let's see, we have David. Okay, is that you, David Acosta? Are you with us? Are you gonna, do you wanna go? If so, just say yes. And uh, the tickets are yours. All right, and I'll get your David Acosta. All right, congrats, David Acosta. You will be receiving the tickets. Uh, I will get your email address from uh, the registration from Zoom, send you the information, and you are there. Please enjoy on behalf of La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. And those of you who uh, did not win the free tickets, here I'm going to post once again the link so that you can purchase tickets and enjoy a wonderful Pulitzer Prize winning play starring with Rosa Portillo, uh, who was a guest uh, with Dan Guerrero a few weeks back. Uh, other guests have included Danny Bolero from Broadway, Luis Valdez, Richard Montoya, Herbert Siguenza, y muchos, muchos más here on En Casa con la Plaza's 
Dan Guerrero Happy Hour. Uh, join us again next time. We don't know who Dan's guest is next uh, in a couple of weeks. I'm going to be off visiting my son and family in the great Northwest, a little cooler than here, uh, for the, uh, starting next Tuesday till the Tuesday after that. So no En Casa Con La Plaza. But on Monday, we would do have En Casa Con La Plaza Cocina at 3 o'clock. I forgot who it is, but if you go to our website, lapca.org, you will find out for yourself. Okay, thanks again to our sponsors. Uh, thank you, David, for your uh, for your email address there. That's great. Uh, our, our sponsors, Union Pacific Foundation, Institute of Museum and Library Services. Catch all our sessions on our website, lapca.org, uh, YouTube, Facebook, all of Dan's. You're welcome, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Muy buenas noches a todos. We'll see you soon. Bye.